All right. Today I want to talk about software architecture. And before I go ahead with this, my usual question is, what did we talk about last time? What do you remember? Mistakes and safeguards. Uh, yes, there was a topic. Can, do you remember a little bit more or anybody else? Or maybe just unmute yourself and say a few words. So maybe can I just call on you, Jake? Um, you already said mistakes and safeguards. Can you say a few more words? Um, yeah, we just went through um, kind of the certainty of mistakes in different situations um, and how there's a different severity depending on what you're dealing with. Like I remember the, uh, the cancer example and then the automated car example. Mm -hmm. Right, so we, we talked about why uh, machine learning systems make mistakes. To some degree, it may not matter, but it matters that they do. Um, Nathan, do you want to say a few words about fault tree analysis? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, so, um, from what I remember, we just uh, we created a fault tree based off the example of a smart uh, toaster that was burning. Um, that's that's the main thing I remember. And you know, breaking down a breaking down a problem and identifying um, uh, how could this uh, problem arise right. based off of other areas within other components within the smart toaster. Right. So that's exactly it. So we talked about risk in general more broadly, right? And different forms of risk analysis and fault tree analysis is one of those things where given a bad outcome, you kind of think about what leads to this outcome, what the kind of things need to occur together, what kind of mitigation strategies must have failed to come to this outcome. And so you can analyze possible risks quantitatively or qualitatively. We also looked at uh, some other techniques, um, right? So the general theme was really thinking through um, possible risks, possible mitigation strategies and plan for that your AI components make mistakes. All right. So today I want to talk about um, software architecture and some of you have just taken a whole class on software architecture. Um, from those people, can I get a volunteer to just in a few words describe what software architecture actually is and why we need it? I see mine grinning. Do you want to try? <laughs> yeah, I guess uh... In architecture, I think uh, we talk mostly about the kind of patterns that we are going to use and uh, how we are going to structure our software um, based on certain quality attribute that might be of concern to us. Um, this could be stuff like um, modifiability or modularity uh, to be able to change things quickly or it could be to, you know, improve performance or improve reliability. Mm -hmm. So what is our software architecture? Um, Mohanesh, you, do you want to give it a shot? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just starting to call on people today, apparently. I think it's the uh, design of, uh, design and interaction of software components uh, based on relevant quality attributes. Oh, right. in like one sentence. Right. Um, it's possibly a bit uh, harder to capture, but what you're saying is probably the essence, right? So you kind of have requirements, you want to get to, the, to some implementation and you need to think about how do you approach the system, right? So software architecture typically corresponds to some high level design, uh, some design decisions, and it's always driven by some qualities that we care about, right? So there's a, um, there's, Typically, it's described in terms of structures and connections and their properties. I don't want to go through this too much, um, but it has a lot of, um, often people think of software architecture as some diagrams that have some purposes, right? So they're used for communication, to think about constraints on the implementation, to think about how you structure teams and um, think about quality attributes, which is probably the most important thing. Let me just race through one case study just to give you a sense of what the scope of kind of software architecture is, right? So especially for those who, who haven't dealt with this too much. 
Who, who remembers the Twitter fail by, just by a show of hands in the camera? This kind of image. Have you seen this? No? All, all too young? Um, so in the early days of Twitter, this was a very common sign that Twitter was overloaded. Um, so around 2010, 2011, I think, um, this was a very common frequent uh, occurrence. For example, in the I think it was the 2010 World Championship soccer games. Every time there was a goal, Twitter was going down because too many people tried to tweet at the same time. Um, so there was a problem here, mostly with regard to capacity. And they were thinking about, well, what's the problem? How, how can we deal with this? And in addition to performance capacity issues, they also had substantial problems of kind of extending the platform, building new features, because of focusing just on scaling and kind of uh, dealing with things. So the way that they tried to scale things so far was just putting in caches everywhere. Right? So it was kind of a traditional database application all written in Ruby on Rails and they added more and more caching but they couldn't kind of push it far enough. By the way, from Twitter's point, uh, all that Twitter does is essentially it's a real-time search engine. Um, that's how they think of this, right? So you have a big database where stuff gets added all the time and whenever you look at your tweet history, um, that's a search essentially for this user and their dependencies also search of keywords and so on. So they actually um, decided they couldn't go on with this. They were just fixing things. They called this whale hunting expeditions where they, with teams, went out to try to fix bugs. And they was complicated. It was one monolithic applications in Ruby on Rails, and they had lots of problems. So they decided they want to redesign things. And Mahin mentioned this already, kind of architecture redesign often focuses on um, quality attributes that we care about. So the first thing, that they did is they tried to figure out what are their redesign goals in terms of quality. So the main thing that they wanted to achieve was higher performance. So they expected that they should get at least a factor of 10 in performance improvement and lower latency, right? Fewer machines to handle this. They also wanted to increase their reliability and maintainability, kind of a fewer failures, more isolated failures, which they had the problems with in their monolithic application and make it easier to extend and to maintain. So at this point, this seemed very hard to do with the existing application. Um, and this is a common example for software architecture that, some, that corresponds often to built in deep understandings that are really hard to change later. Uh, Zichuan, you have a question? Yes, so, um, so the, you wrote the reduced number of machine 10x. So reducing the number of machines being deployed is actually an explicit goal. Yeah. Is that so, what it means or? Yeah, so, so they, they were, they figured out that the way that Ruby was running and the implementation was running was super expensive. They had very few users that they could serve per machine. So they, they were essentially just throwing money at AWS, I think, at the time, just buying more and more, renting more and more machines. And they figured they should be able to improve their performance by a lot that they need to rent way fewer machines. Okay. Cool. So they actually went out and completely redesigned their implementation. They essentially scrapped everything that they had and re-implemented this and thought about how to do this in a much more systematic way. Right? You can do this if you have these goals, if you have these performance goals and reliability goals um, to start thinking more systematically top down, how do you design something? And there are lots of quite fundamental changes that they made in their redesign. First of all, they ditched Ruby on Rails entirely and they went to the JVM and Scala. They have some changes since, but they mostly stuck with this. Um, they also changed from a monolithic application, kind of one big Ruby on Rails, uh, uh, architecture into kind of microservices, it's fairly popular, right? M multiple small implementations that call each other over remote procedure calls. They invested in this remote procedure call framework to um, do calls between these things. Um, so they have their own library for uh, making these calls, which includes some monitoring and failover strategies and load balancing and all this kind of stuff built in. 
And they actually went out and designed a very different storage solution. So one bottleneck, if you're doing kind of temporal storage is, if you're writing to a machine and you need a, a concrete order in which stuff is uh, written, you need one single point where all tweets go through that they can be ordered. Right? So they changed actually to a different database design where they have, where they generate IDs, but they are only roughly sortable. So within a second, they can't necessarily sort them, but they can sort them at kind of the second granularity, which means you can write to parallel databases. You're generating keys that are big enough that the collisions are unlikely, but that you don't need to go through one bottleneck. So what I'm trying to, I don't wanna to go too much into details here. If you're interested, um, there's a blog post where they were really proud about kind of uh, scaling this and having new records on how many tweets they can support where they talk about this. The key point that I want you to take away here is um, the level of decisions that relate to architecture, right? So it's how do you structure your system at scale? Do you have one monolithic application or multiple services? How do they talk to each other? How do you deploy a monitoring or debugging infrastructure and you bake it into the remote procedure call interface? Or fundamentally, how do you store your data? How, do you, how can you deal with data storage that you can parallelize it, that you can scale it? Um, things like this, right? So all of these decisions, they always come from a quality attribute. And I hope this matches very well what you kind of talked about or some of you talked about in the architecture course, right? So you typically start by thinking about what qualities are important at the system level. And then you think about the main structures of the system or what are the parts of the, the key design choices, maybe for data storage, maybe for distributing the computation that matter with regard to those qualities. Make sense? So, these architectural decisions affect the entire system, not just individual modules, not just the machine learning component, right? Um, and they, you try to abstract and look at different scenarios. Um, you may, you reason about quality attributes early, right? This is the key design, the key design problem here. You think about performance before you implement the system, rather than kind of what they did before, let's insert a few caches to make it, the system faster, right? And there are some decisions that you try to make explicit. There's a question here, and I don't want to go too much into, into this, but when they started Twitter and built this an, as a monolithic application, you could argue maybe they were stupid, right? They kind of built a system that obviously wouldn't scale and they didn't carefully think about these properties. There's a counter argument to be had uh, that when they started Twitter, those were not the same goals. Right, so in Twitter's case, the goals that they had changed. They started Twitter to the product fast, um, to, and it doesn't matter any users whether it scales. Right, so it's actually a pretty smart move in their case initially to build on the framework that they knew that they could prototype something, get something running quickly, and then when it's successful, maybe you have enough money to actually rewrite this, which is what they did. Right, but it's a very different design afterward than it was before. All right, um, just briefly to kind of give a bit more of a sense of, um, of how you think about software architecture. What are you seeing here? Google Maps. It's Google Maps, it's a map of Pittsburgh. Right, so it's some abstraction. What is this thing good for? When would you use this? Navigation on roads, right? So something like this. So um, let me contrast this. What's this? Topological map. The topological map and bike maps. Right, so this is the bike network, at least three years ago, I think, in Pittsburgh. What would you use this for instead of the first map? Might be faster if you just unmute yourself. So choosing a bike, biking path, navigating right where you kind of care about hills, for example, 
So if you're navigating on a bike, you might not recognize where it's really steep with this map, right? You don't really realize which roads are mappy, uh, uh, heavy traffic, maybe except for the highways that you might want to avoid, um, right? So this map has a different purpose, but it kind of represents the same thing. What's, ah, uh, crap, I have the title here. I wanted to take that out. So this map is fire zones of Pittsburgh and firehouses. Why would you care about, who would care about this map? What kind of decisions are you making with this map? I guess like first responder decisions. Maybe. Which fire department to dis dispatch in an emergency, right? So dispatchers might care about this. City planners might care about this to know where are fire stations, how far are they, how quickly do they get somewhere, right? Um, so what I've tried to do with this kind of silly example is showing you three different maps of the same thing kind of, right? All of this is about Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is the actual thing. And these maps are abstractions. These are abstract representation of something. And each of these abstractions are different, even though they represent kind of the same physical city. And each of these abstractions have different purposes, right? So if, he, if we want to reason about where to put a new firehouse, we would use a different map than if we want to find the right bike lane, uh, bike pass, right? This is kind of obvious if we're talking about maps. But this is a nice analogy to kind of architectural modeling, where you often draw some diagrams and you think about specific attributes. For example, when you care about performance in Twitter, you might sketch some structure of the Twitter system. You might sketch what are all their servers, what are the connections, and put in some maybe latency for some calls in there. So that's one abstraction of the Twitter system that you can use to reason about performance bottlenecks. And if you think about extensibility of Twitter, you might draw a different diagram. You think about the system, about different system abstractions, right? So similar of how we have different kind of maps, we care about different kind of properties and we might use different kinds of um, abstractions for this. And so in software architecture, you often have box and line diagrams and they can mean very different things. And you can reason about some things with some diagrams and other things with other diagrams. So this is an architectural diagram that shows that there's a system and some connections and it shows uh, a network interface that some users are kind of in-house and some users outside. And so you could use some of this to reason about security. For example, you can think about with a diagram like this, with a deployment architecture, where should you put in encryption? Um, and you would probably not reason about can reason a little bit about performance there, but probably not much about maintainability or extensibility. This is an architectural diagram of the Google file system, um, big file system where they can store massive kind of files where, they, where you have some sort of master server and a bunch of chunk servers that store the actual files and the master servers stores the index to those files. And you can start thinking about all kinds of different properties like redundancy, you have these chunk servers, they might be redundant to some degree. You can start thinking about performance, that you make some lookups into this table, but the main traffic goes to the chunk servers, not to the master, right? So you can start reason about connections, about different kinds of qualities, and a diagram like this might support you in reasoning. Make sense? So I suspect that to most of you, software architecture is not new and that you have seen this. I just wanted to remind you kind of of the idea. It's kind of domain specific reasoning. It's reasoning or drawings also about specific properties, right? And from here, I kind of want to go to machine learning and what kind of architectural decisions do we have maybe commonly or more or less commonly with, um, uh, with machine learning. So I want to use a case study of um, augmented reality translation today. I want to use this as a, a common thing. Does anybody know where this picture is? Roughly, can anybody read these signs? I can't. Somewhere in Korea. Yep, it's somewhere in Seoul. Um, 
So this is something I was supposed to go to Seoul for a conference this year that was canceled because of COVID. Um, but this is a place where I can't read anything. Right? So we have a couple of um, applications. Have you used kind of the instant translation thing with video on a Google Translate does this, for example? Um, by show of hands, who knows this kind of feature? Okay, most of you, right? So the, the idea here is that you can really take a video, you can take a screenshot as well, but you can take a video and it labels text over things that you're seeing, right? So this is kind of almost magic. It works pretty well where you just hold your phone over something, you move it a little bit that you have it inside and it prints the target languages text over it as if it was in place, right? It's kind of an in-place translation. And for this case study, I want to push this one step further. I want to do kind of augmented reality, uh, kind of think about smart glasses, like Google glasses weren't that successful, but there are a couple of companies trying something like this again. And wouldn't it be nice if you can just walk through Korea and it automatically in your glasses translates um, what, you, what you can't read otherwise into English or whatever language you prefer. Right, so that's kind of the case study that I want to talk about. Kind of instant translation in glasses, kind of projected over reality while you're looking at it. So kind of the same idea as this, just on a different device and running. Make sense? So for translation or for this kind of thing, we need at least two parts. We need to detect characters in a picture or in a video stream right, where they are, what the text is, and then we need a translation module. So there are at least two AI components, one OCR, kind of a character recognition component, and one translation component. And the first, oh, we can talk about a bunch of qualities, let's get there in a second. Uh, the first decision, the second decision I wanna talk about is where the model should live. Right, so we can first of all talk about what are the trade-offs between different modeling techniques, but we have already talked about this, right? So that some stuff might run better on glasses, have smaller files, so it's easier to update. But I wanna talk about, and this was a little bit in your readings as well, where should the model live? Right, so we have three obvious places. And actually we have two models. We have the OCR model and we have the translation model, right? It could live on the phone, it could live in the glasses, they have a small processor, and it could live in the cloud. And let me just, before, I, before we start a discussion, let me just open a poll um, and just wanna see what you're thinking. So just vote for a second. All right, so it was kind of an even split between phone and cloud and almost nobody wants to do this thing on glasses. So let me collect a few things. So we want to make a decision about where we're running this, right? Um, what are the qualities that we care about? What's relevant for thinking about uh, where to put this? What do we care about in this system? Latency, so um, does anybody have a sense of what latency we need? Does I might actually work? disagree with latency. Okay. I mean, if we're just trying to scan stationary images and it takes a second or two, um, if, if that gets it more accurate, I would trade off the extra accuracy in return for waiting for a moment. So I want this as augmented reality. So I want to okay. go through a city with my glasses on and see this live translated, right? Kind of overlay on, if there's a shop, I want to see what's written in the window, right? As I walk through it. Um, so under two seconds, definitely under two seconds. Um, 
there's also different components, right? So if I move my head, I, the text needs to stay in the same position and maybe I don't need to translate it again. Um, I actually looked up some of the stuff before the lecture today. Um, let me see whether I find it. Um, so latency, it becomes annoying if the latency is larger than 200 milliseconds for speech. This is where people feel uncomfortable um, that there's a pause and people kind of interrupt you, right? Um, below 20 milliseconds, you perceive a delay, a noticeable delay. If it's haptic, it's below 10 milliseconds. And there are studies that show that there's a term cyber sickness that I didn't know before that people talk about around uh, augmented reality. So if the delay is too high, it's kind of nauseating, it's kind of weird. Um, so it's somewhere between five and 20 milliseconds that you have. So, um, so this, is, this is roughly one of the qualities that we care about, right? Very low latency, at least for some components, maybe not for the entire thing. The translation might take a second to show up, but if it's overlaid, at least figuring out where it is, we need to have fairly quickly. So let's see uh, translation and OCR accuracy, accuracy is another thing that was mentioned. Um, let's see what else. Um, so the device should not overheat, right? So energy consumption, both for overheating and how long your batteries last. Um, how often, yeah, model update frequency. Um, battery consumption, uh, do I see anything else? Any other things? Model size, kind of hardware requirements, right? Um, image quality input, okay. Confidence, I put this back into kind of accuracy and um, how well this performs, right? Robustness of the actual translation, availability. I like that. Um, low light handling, right? So kind of robustness to certain kinds of inputs in the translation part. Um, for most of what I'm talking about today, I focus on qualities of the entire system not so much of the ML component, but that's part of it, right? Um, so let's start with this. Let's start a discussion. Um, if I want to put, so let's assume my glasses are connected via Bluetooth to my phone and my phone is connected with this um, cellular, cellular networks, um, 4G, 5G to the cloud, right? Can somebody argue for one of the possible deployments? Why would you put this on the phone rather than on the glasses, for example? Uh, Leo? Uh, because I'm, I'm assuming that uh, phone and glasses are communicating via either Bluetooth or very short range Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. which should uh, give us enough connection speed and also uh, bandwidth to translate all the necessary information. And uh, from what I know, the current uh, chip technology, uh, doing all those computations on a glass will cons uh, consume too much of glass uh, batteries and might not last for very long. Uh, whereas if you're doing it on a phone, it could sustain for a relatively long time. So um, that would be the, so, so why I, I would prefer phone than glasses. Okay. So you made a bunch of assumptions there and I think this is a place where if we want to analyze performance of different designs, right, bandwidth requirements, um, this is actually where we can get more information. Um, can you just open Google and try to figure out what bandwidth requirements or what's the bandwidth that we have available with Bluetooth and what bandwidth do we need to kind of get video from the camera, from the glasses to the phone? So uh, let's see. I suspect that most of you don't know the bandwidth of Bluetooth. Um, I had to look this up myself. So assume it's a Bluetooth 5.0, which is pretty widely accessible for modern phones. Mm -hmm. uh, the bandwidth is usually around two megabits per second. Okay. 
Wi-Fi is about 50 megabits, uh, just for comparison. Yep. Um, so two megabits. Um, do you have a sense of video streaming? Uh, what bandwidth you need there? Uh, to stream in uh, 1080p, that's normally three megabits per second. Okay, that's over. Uh, but 720p is somewhere between one and uh, one and a half megabits mm -hmm. per second. Right. So, so that's roughly what we're working with here. Right? Oh, that's assuming 30 frames per second. Uh -huh. Which, I mean, if you're looking at five millisecond turnaround, right? So you kind of need a probably a fairly high frame rate. Um, so, so video streaming, when I, when I looked at it today is kind of 10 Mbit is kind of low quality, but what you're describing smaller, yes, you can compress it also, right? Um, the Google Glass camera is a five megapixel camera, but you don't yep. need to send this in the highest resolution. Right? Yeah. So I was just thinking along the lines of, it could also depend on what company is actually making the product because uh, I'm aware that uh, Apple makes use of their airdrop technology a lot, which uh, in the back end works over Wi-Fi. So mm -hmm. it uses Bluetooth just to uh, latch on to the device and all, all the bandwidth is sent over Wi-Fi. Sure. Uh, but if you're working with an, an off-brand glasses and an off-brand phone, then uh, we don't really know how much support for such technologies is available. Mm -hmm. So I think this, these are all good comments. This is kind of where I wanted to get at. Um, to actually make a consideration here, we, te we typically need more information, right? So we need to kind of understand what are the connections that we're dealing with. Um, and maybe with an Apple device and all in-house hardware, we have very different requirements and we have different design opportunities, right? So if, I, if you think about kind of streaming video to the, um, to the phone with the right compression or so, we might saturate the um, Bluetooth bandwidth, but it might be possible, right? Um, kind of sending back, we probably just need the coordinates where to put what string. We don't need to send video back probably. We could, but then we have the same kind of bandwidth the other way. Right, so you probably only send partial information back. Um, you certainly can't send images in the full resolution uh, of the camera, but maybe you don't want to do that anyway, right? Because it's maybe too expensive for kind of to keep the camera on at all times. Um, in general, when we're making these kind of decisions, this is really, this is a kind of domain specific modeling that I was talking about earlier, right? The map of Pittsburgh, we kind of need to think about for performance, what are the things or for latency, what are the things that matter, right? Um, and then we often need to go out and collect some data, figure out what are our design parameters? What are our choices? What can we do? What can't we do? So it seems like fully streaming the images to the phone and processing them on the phone might be kind of pushing it, but might be possible depending on what technology we have. There's probably also some hybrid approaches. So um, you probably don't need to do the translation on the glasses that can have a much higher latency, but maybe OCR could work directly on the glasses and then you're just sending text back and forth rather than um, the full images, right? Or maybe you can pre-process the images in a very lightweight way to figure out where is their text and you compress this in other parts that you send selective information. There might be a lot of strategies that you can think about that you can design here. And the key point is again, if you think of the Twitter case study, instead of just building something and figuring out later, can we make it fast enough? When you design this, you step back and you think about what are all the connections, what are the kind of things that we need to know about, what will constrain our design. And I think bandwidth in this specific case is fairly important. What's the kind of latency that you would expect for Bluetooth? Does anybody know? Yeah, Leo? Actually. I just looked at it when I was looking at bandwidth, it's usually 200 milliseconds. That seems 
kind of beyond what seems comfortable for um, for um, uh, augmented reality, right? So maybe that's okay to stream it and do some uh, image recognition on the phone as long as you have some stabilizing part that tracks kind of pixels as you're moving your head that if if you know where text should go, you can move it with the image, right? So again, different design decisions. Maybe you don't need to process everything in real time on the phone. Oh, so sorry, I, I actually, uh, that, that was the, the 200 was for 2.0, 5.0 usually reduced it to 40, 40 milliseconds. Which might still be in the, um, yeah. in the cyber sickness territory, right? Um, so, the other question that we should probably figure out is how much can we actually process on the glasses, right? So this might require some experiments if we do OCR on the glasses or if we just detect what the parts of the image are that are maybe containing characters, how much would this take? How quickly would this drain our battery, right? So this is nothing that I can send you to look up. This is something where we probably need to run some experiments. Um, we probably also want to think about kind of model size, um, although at least the glasses model, which is now a couple of years old, had 16 gigabytes of storage. And I think most OCR models aren't that big by far. Um, most, do you have a sense how big language models are? How big is a download of uh, Google Translate for an offline model? Let me just check. Korean to English is uh, 53 megabytes. So that's something that we could easily handle on the glasses. Oops. Um, so what about other qualities? Um, so model size doesn't seem to be a huge issue. Um, how often are we updating models in this case? What do you think? Probably not very often. Yeah, uh, Korean doesn't evolve that quickly, I think. Yeah. We, so so the, there's little data drift probably, right? Um, so that's not the reason. We might update it once in a while to improve our models. That's maybe we might get away with once a year, once a month or something like this, right? It's not every five minutes. So it might not be too bad to deploy some of those models. Um, also, if there's an update and let's say we need to download these 50 megabytes, this seems again like something that we could download to a phone and push to the glasses um, without too much effort, right? It's not too costly, it's not too big. Um, what about availability? So I guess it's things like working offline. Right, so this kind of rules out the cloud solution if we wanted to work offline. On the phone is probably fine, um, depending on our use case, but we might accept that if the phone is dead, uh, then we can't translate automatically anymore. The users might accept this, right? We're not sure how, how useful those glasses are without a phone anyway. Um, never had some. Yeah, so I, I haven't. Um, Good. I think uh, if we can have a, actually a smaller model deployed on the local devices, then we will be able to provide some limited services to users. Yep. So, so I, I would suspect in this particular, ca particular case that you might want to go with some hybrid solution, right? So you have OCR, you have um, the translation part, you have, um, um, you have maybe an extra step that identifies only part of the image that's relevant to send it somewhere. And uh, I suspect you want to do some stuff on the glasses, not just blindly stream everything to the phone, right? That's sending a lot of stuff over, over Bluetooth all the time. Um, it might be more energy efficient to do some computation on the glasses. Um, and I suspect a pure cloud solution is unlikely, right? So that you send every, the video stream to the cloud, that's a massive amount of data that you're transferring there and wouldn't work offline, which seems kind of useful in this case and not unfeasible, right? Because the OCR models and the language translation models aren't super massive. So it's something that you can probably deal with. Make sense? Yeah. 
Anything else that I've been missing? Any other qualities, anything that kind of would speak against deploying it, kind of hybrid on glasses and phone? All right. I think we talked about these things. Um, so how much data do we need? How, how, how much output data is produced by the model, right? Relatively little here. How fast energy consuming is a model execution, if, especially if you do need to do this all the time. What's the latency? How big is the model? The cost of operating the model. Um, um, we haven't talked about telemetry. Um, we'll come back to this later. Um, and what happens if users are online, uh, offline? Right, so we talked about bandwidth and latency. Um, and in the book, they, um, Jeff Holden distinguished these five designs. Do you remember what's the difference between the first two? Static intelligence in the product versus client-side intelligence. Mahin? So, uh I was a little confused about this, but from what I understood, uh, static intelligence to me seemed like uh, build once and forget about it yep. uh, sort of a thing. Whereas client side intelligence, though uh, it also includes building the model and storing it on the client side, uh, regular updates are possible via software updates or right. That's, that's my understanding as well, right? So client-side intelligence means the intelligence is some component that you can update independently of the product, right? So you can install a new version of the language model on your phone or on, on the cloud. It's not built into the operating system or kind of into the app itself. It's a separate component, right? And I think static intelligence in a product where you have no update mechanism, you might do this uh, if you deploy it with some apps or if you have some hardware device, but really only if you're sure that you're not improving the model, that you don't really expect data drift, right? And server-centric just means put everything on the cloud, right? Ask on demand. Backend cached uh, um, intelligence was where you pre-compute things, right? So you, you have a certain number of things that are common, like popularity of certain movies. So if you expect they are, uh, you need them frequently, you can pre-compute this, right? And then a lot of hybrid things where you really need to talk about what you're doing. And we talked about the hybrid model. All right. So uh, just a quick question. Where would you use something like static intelligence? Uh, I mean, I think nowadays everything does provide the ability to have software updates, even, you know, the tiniest of, uh, IoT devices still have the ability to update. Does somebody have an example? Maybe some a robot in space or something where the bandwidth was really small? Maybe. Yeah, I was thinking like a, a military uh, deployment like at Edge. Yeah. Um, you could also do client-side intelligence and operate it mostly offline and sometimes connect to it to update, right? Um, but you could have some build and forget things, Leo. Also, the the one thing that I come up with is the is the the, the guiding com uh, guiding computer inside uh inside cruise missiles. So for those kind of things, it's built for one-time uses, and once okay. it's launched, usually you cannot change its course. So this, yep. and also it could be operating on uh, under huge electronic interference. So the things yep. has to work on its own. So yep. that's yep. kind of like a static intelligence thing. That's a good and somewhat depressing example. Um, maybe a less depressing example, toys, um, like children's toys that do some simple voice recognition or some pattern recognition, right? Uh, where you have just a tiny chip and you hard bake some model into it that it's voice activated or, or something like this. Right, uh, which are done to throw away so you wouldn't update them. And yeah, not every device needs kind of internet connection probably, right? But many have um, for better or for worse. 
Um, right, so, so what, what we've done here is look at one architectural decision, right? Where to place the model, kind of a deployment architecture. Um, and we talked already about how to decompose it, what are the kind of qualities that we care about, right? And the kind of decision making that we talked about is kind of common for this kind of task, right? Where you think about what, what are the qualities that matter in the end? What are the qualities um, that different solutions have? What are the key things that I should explore like bandwidth, latency, energy consumption, that you can start thinking about trade-offs, right? That you can start thinking about decisions that you're making and building prototypes. Um, another big thing that I wanna talk about is telemetry. And we kind of talk about telemetry in almost every lecture, but there's again, a lot of design here that you wanna think about early. Right? Telemetry has these two functions. You wanna see in production how well you're doing, and you want to collect new data, new training data for future iterations. Not necessarily always both, but those are often two common functions. Right? So in this translation example, we want to know how can we detect when something is mistranslated, right? Or when we don't recognize the characters. And we want to design a mechanism that we can learn about it, that we can maybe learn from our mistakes and make our models better. Um, so, how would you do this? How would you approach this? Yeah, go for it. Mine. So, um, what I can think of off the bat is um, you could use predictions that are low confidence, um, that you're not showing to the user as a translation, but you've been able to detect that there is some text on the screen. Okay. So you would use your model predictions or part of your model predictions to identify things that you're not very sure about, there are possible mistakes or possible things that you should be able to do but can't do right now, um, and essentially send a screenshot or? Sort of, yeah. Okay. Because this is one, um, one area where you can't really ask the user for feedback because uh, if he's asking you to translate something, he definitely doesn't know the language. Yeah, there, there are some things. So to Google Translate, there's a mechanism of how you can report wrong translations. So I'm not sure how this is ever incorporated really, right? And it's kind of potential adversarial attack kind of scenario. Uh, there's no feedback button that I know of in Google Translate on the phone that I can say this is wrong. And I think, so in some cases, I may have a sense that this doesn't make sense, right? Or I have some other way of figuring out that it's wrong. Um, so Vivex has um, feedback for cases where the English doesn't make sense, um, maybe also where the original language doesn't make sense, right? It, um, so the OCR detection seems to pick something up that doesn't seem to be a word, right? So it could be um, something. Any other ideas? So we could, first of all, stream everything from my glasses always to the cloud and have somebody just randomly look at some pictures, right? Um, and see, kind of have an expert see whether this is recognized or translated correctly. We could also have a better model um, that's than the low thing. But then we're sending everything, right? Which is probably has a bunch of problems. So what you already talked about are some strategies of figuring out what is kind of some subset of the data that we might want to send, right? So do we have low prediction things? Um, um, Leo, can you say a few words? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Um, so for maybe for a lot of the scenarios where a translation happened, a lot of the users are requesting for the same translation of the maybe sim same or similar thing from different angles at very nearby locations. 
And yeah. if those things are turned on, we can see if we get a coherent result from uh, from multiple users to see if the things is working or not. Do yeah, you, you could you could check whether yeah if you have similar images that you get similar outputs or I think. Um, Somebody mentioned this also in another lecture. If you have something where the user kind of moves the camera always a little bit, right, to kind of see something and the text changes or so, this could be a sign that it's unstable, that somebody is trying to fix things because the translation is kind of broken, right? So certain movements might indicate kind of bad quality. Um, anything else? So telemetry design is, is challenging, right? Um, so we want to monitor operations, we want to detect mistakes, we want to improve our models over time, but um, can, we can't just stream everything, right? It's too much data. But also if we just randomly sample something, like send an image every minute or so, we might get very random data that's maybe, it's representative, but maybe not very useful, right? And often what we can do is very hard to kind of approximate quality, especially if you're looking for rare events, right? So maybe translation works well most of the time or 90% of the cases there is no text, but then in the very rare event that there is text and it's wrong, um, those are the things that we would like to see, right? And then if we're sending too much data, it can be actually really expensive to operate this. So let's say we have a million users that are all wearing their glasses and we're trying to stream everything into the cloud, right? To just see what everybody is seeing the entire time. Um, that gives us so much data that this is kind of ex expensive just to collect and store and keep the operation, right? And of course, so what's the privacy implications of this, right? Do, we, do users know and want you to see um, what they are seeing in their glasses? Right? Is there a way of doing some sort of hands-off debugging where you can detect on the glasses whether you're doing well or not and just send that information back? back? Any ideas with those considerations? You can, so I suspect there's always a strategy that you can just have somebody hand label certain events, right? Somebody who knows the language, looks at it, or is, <coughs> is the OCR component working? Is the translation component working? Um, but again, how much data are we collecting? When are we collecting data? Uh, how much data is this producing? You could collect the data on the phone, for example, like, um, how long you held the, you know, looked at a specific thing to, to say sort of um, how accurate it would be because you'd probably look longer if it didn't make sense or something like that. And then kind of batch send it. So like, I don't know, every hour it's got some records and it just kind of sends what it deems important. Mm -hmm. You could probably also once in a while ask the user whether they're happy with the translation. Oh, yeah. Um, do you have a sense of how much data we're producing if we're sending pictures? So it's a five megapixel camera. Um, how, how big is a single still picture that we would send roughly? Couple hundred kilobytes, that seems optimistic. Depends on compression, I guess, but it's, I would guess a few megabytes. So a screenshot on my phone, which has a lower resolution, two megapixels I looked up is two megabytes. Um, the pictures that my phone takes, I think are slightly higher resolution, but um, they are a couple of megabyte territory. So let's say two megabytes. Um, if we are sending this over a cellular connection, uh, how much will it cost the user? What's the cost of two megabytes? I mean, this depends a lot. In, in Europe, this would be way cheaper than here in the US. Um, with my, my connection, it's about it's $10 per gigabyte, I think, um, up to a limit and then it's cheaper. Um, so it's about two cents per picture that we're sending, 
if we're sending this over cellular connection, right? So if you're asking the user to send telemetry data every minute, it's two cents every minute um, if we send it over cellular connection, right? So you kind of want to be careful also. So the typical strategy is probably to buffer it and send it over Wi-Fi. Um, that's, I think, what most people do, kind of wait with it and upload. But again, do you have user consent? How much data are you sending, right? Are they on a plan where they have a limit? So that, again, lots of considerations here about what can we collect? How expensive is this? And then also, if we're getting like a two megabyte picture from every user every minute, and we have a million users, how many incoming images do we have? And how many of those can we sample with crowdsourced workers or some other tools, right? So there, again, kind of interesting discussions here where you really need to step back and think about what are the qualities here that I care about? What are possible design choices and how do my design choices impact these qualities? Any more ideas of what you would do here? Um, yeah, I think on the similar, similar line, um, you could cache sort of the, um, uh, the low confidence predictions and uh, OCR on the phone um, and perhaps, I guess, wait, say, all day. Um, and then I guess you can, based on that, you can sample, uh, I guess, you can see like what are the actual low comp lowest confidence uh, predictions and then only send those up. Okay. Later. Be careful though, Leon, a second. Be careful though that um, confidence of the model doesn't need to be reliable, right? It can be wrong on a very, with very high confidence. Low confidence is one indication of the model knows that it doesn't really know, right? Uh, you might also care about the things where the model is very, very sure, but very wrong. Um, it's hard to detect, especially because we expect it to be rare. Leo? Uh, so one thing I'm thinking is uh, the telemetry data are useless if we don't look at them. So mm -hmm. we can actually temporarily cache those data on the user's phone and uh, do like a multi-storage cache. So we have a center cache at our, uh, cache at our server that are regularly pulling in the, the telemetry data stored on user's phone. And those caches at the center are gonna be used, uh, like they're, we're gonna use it very uh, very soon. And for the things that we might want to use, but we don't have the time to look at it, we'll just uh, set, maybe set a cache size limit on the user's phone, just mm -hmm. store them there and pull them whenever we need them. And also the, those data stored on user's phone can be replaced by a uh, new cache telemetry data. So when we get, when we pull, we'll always pull the latest results. And for those that gets ignored, we're not going to use it anyway. So it's not certain uh, something that will hurt uh, from or de uh, from a development perspective. Okay. Yeah. Let's assume we work in a company that cares about privacy or claims to care about privacy. Uh, would this change your telemetry view? Like this here. Um, no, I don't. It's kind of sensitive data, right? If you're recording from Google Glasses the entire time, even just randomly sending images to a cloud might, might make people fairly uncomfortable. Is there any kind of information where we don't just randomly send things, but only with the user's consent or um, where we only send information that's non-problematic? Could, could the phone kind of scrub out a lot of the data? So, I mean, all that we care about mostly is the, um, is the text. So it could, you know, remove all non-text from the image or something like that. Yeah, we might lose quite a bit of information um, f that might be useful for debugging, but that's a common problem. Mm -hmm. um, kind of blur out faces or something like this, for example, automatically, right? Um, uh, maybe. 
you might have something where you interactively kind of you po uh, prompt the user, can you give us some feedback on some of the translations with, that we have made? And then if you say it's bad, give them permission to share this image, right? So that you're actually designing a user interface where they need to ask you. Um, like Google Map asked you about feedback about how your ride was, right? And you can ignore that, like um, kind of something like this. Um, I'm not sure that they are, they're probably not asking for permission whether they can use that specific information after I've rated it. Um, you might be able to anonymize the information and only send text when, when it's about the translations. Maybe that's, that's critical. It depends where you draw the line. Right? So kind of uh, eyes off debugging, kind of where you're trying to improve a model but you're not allowed to see user data is actually a big problem. It's one of the big challenges that a bunch of companies are working on facing um, if they're not allowed to see telemetry data. It's also a question if, you, if you're working offline with this thing, right? So we just talked about um, that this should be able to work offline. Are you collecting telemetry and sending it later or are you giving up on telemetry entirely? If you have a, uh, the built-in client-side model where you may not have any internet connection, you probably have a hard time ever getting telemetry, right? Um, right. Um, so I have a few more things, but they're all kind of smaller in scale. Um, so I think everybody's converging more or less to serve models as kind of an independent service. Right, so one thing that you want to avoid is that the, com the machine learning component is somewhere baked in deeply because this is something, it's kind of the old design for change principle, right? So you don't wanna have this in a place where you need to update the entire app if just a machine learning component changes because a machine learning component might change more frequently, right? So what people do a lot is kind of have this as a separate service. You build something like this in the, um, in the first and the second homework assignment, right? So kind of think of this as a microservice architecture where you just have an in, endpoint to make predictions for a model, right? It's also quite common to have a, a gateway service that scales this and does load balancing. If you need to serve the model, need to scale it up that you have multiple copies of the model, you automatically balance it. You can go to a new version. We talk about uh, A-B testing canary releases on Thursday, those kind of things. Um, Right. Um, also the learning process and the learning data could be kind of decoupled a little bit, um, but the common thing is to have kind of an inference API. Um, so for OCR, what might an API look like? What's the input, what's the output for kind of a microservice for the, for the model here? Just text in, text out kind of thing, that's right? For, that's for translation, right? For OCR, it would be probably image in or part oh. of the image. Yeah. And output is a text in the location on the image, yeah, something like this. Um, so you would just build kind of a REST API or some other API, maybe for images and videos, probably not REST, but some, some kind of slow, lowly, decoup lowly coupled service, but for web kind of, for cloud-backed things, it's almost always a REST API or something like this, right? Or whatever remote procedure call you're doing where you send an image or you send text and you get the result back. And that's something that you can then just easily swap out, right? So you kind of want to future-proof the API, think about what kind of changes you might need. Uh, is there more than the image? Do you need some metadata? Um, do you want to make this flexible or not? Um, what kind of model changes are you expecting? And then the other part is, um, and we'll talk about this later, you kind of want versioning to version everything. So when you have an answer, you kind of want to know that it was created with version five of the model. This is very useful for debugging later, especially if you get some telemetry thing back and it says on this image, it didn't recognize this text. Um, and it may have used an offline model that's maybe a week out of date. You kind of want to know which version of the model was used uh, to create this, right? So kind of provenance tracking, keeping what the, what the old uh, version is. Um, 
Right, and then if you do this as a service, you can use all the classic things for cloud computing and so on, load balancer, redundancy. Um, it's a separate service. If it crashes, it doesn't take down the rest of the system, right? Um, and you can do some logging and some, some um, analysis of the typical um, service levels that you're achieving, right? Latency and so on. Another thing that's a, a frequent design discussion is thinking about when and how to update models, right? So there's another architecture level discussion. Um, models change, right? Um, depending on, on the scenario, they change more or less frequently. Uh, we talked already about um, kind of this scenario that the models are probably not getting stale very frequently, right? Um, characters don't change that frequently. Words in the language don't change that frequently. Um, updates are probably coming from us developing better models, more accurate models. But you can think of other scenarios where maybe you're recognizing certain things that kind of slang words that come more frequently or you recognizing something that gets updated every day or so where you want very frequent information, right? And that changes very much of how you're, how you're thinking about updates. So here you need to think about how frequently do I update? What's the cost of an update? There's some data transfer. Can I incrementally send models? Can I have smaller models to make the updates cheaper? Uh, things like this. Um, and there's a whole bunch of things that we will talk about later next week, I think, um, of kind of designs of how you can incrementally learn over time, kind of from a streaming service. As data comes in, you automatically update the models all the time that you kind of have a constantly evolving model. All right. Um, and maybe also just briefly, um, there are lots of cloud services that companies provide that will be happy to take a lot of the complexity away from you, right? So you can buy uh, an image here that's the Azure platform. One of the useful things is with TensorFlow these days, if you have a model, you can just push it through the cloud and somebody else cares about how many copies do you need um, to do an inference service that's highly available, that's uh, scalable and so on, right? And lots of other things. Also for learning, there's all these platforms where you just reuse existing things. Um, but, so there's always a question of whether you buy or build something. That's a big kind of architectural decision. And there's all this infrastructure that you can often reuse and build in the cloud. So the last thing that I want to talk about here is um, architectural styles, architectural tactics, design patterns, and so on. Um, and I gave you a blog post to read and I suspect this was not particularly deep and insightful. Um, I think though this is fairly representative of the state of the art in my perception. So in my perception, not a lot of people think systematically about architecture and patterns, kind of best practices, reusable design trade-offs um, that are encoded in some form. Right? So the main thing that people talk about is instead of a big script architecture, use some microservice architecture where you encapsulate the inference services, right? So the modeling part. And then the other thing you might see about is focus on pipelines, right? Automate um, things. Uh, I've read a few papers that talk, that are trying to create a catalog of patterns or things like this. I've never found anything. They're all over the place. Um, you have some patterns that are, about how to scale deep learning learning algorithms, kind of the uh, parameter server is something like this. this. is very specific to a specific style of learning. This has very little to do with kind of deployment. Um, the other big pattern that I see a lot is kind of the um, gateway architecture where you have one central point to ask all the models for load balancing and so on. Um, but honestly, I, I don't see a lot beyond kind of microservices, gateway routing. And then on the data side, you see more like a data lake and the Lambda architecture and some reuse, uh, some continuous deployment and so on. So I think this is a, in, ge <coughs> in general, a lot of this is fairly new still, um, right? So a lot of companies are building their own infrastructure, they are learning. Um, I think a lot of time we're just using common best practices that we know from other systems. Um, 
I don't know how much we need to specifically customize for this. I suspect that if we think hard about this, we will come up with reference architectures for telemetry design and different kind of designs and trade-offs that we know or design patterns, right? We might come up with something for deployment architectures, like common combinations, common kind of considerations that we can learn of. Um, I haven't seen much in this area and maybe we're just too early, maybe it's not needed, I'm not entirely sure. Um, there are a couple of anti-patterns, anti um, but I think again, kind of maybe obvious and maybe also not all entirely uncontroversial. Right, but things like pipeline jungles all over the place and undocumented, um, some blue code that just batches things together, all kinds of languages. But again, I, it doesn't feel like a con cohesive structure kind of concept like you see in a bunch of design patterns books or in architectural patterns sometimes where you would maybe think about qualities that you're trying to achieve and then think about tactics, think about kind of a codified catalog of approaches to do this. Um, yeah. Any questions on this? Have you seen anything maybe? Um, am I missing something? My impression is that this is a useful area where I think sharing experience in kind of how to build this, how to scale something like this might be very useful. Um, maybe it's not that different from different distributed systems and different big data systems. I suspect certain architectural patterns also to deal with wrong predictions might be useful. Right, certain patterns about how to implement things to make them maintainable. What I see more happening is that a bunch of companies and a bunch of open source tools are coming out to kind of codify best engineering practices. This is often kind of um, how to lay out your uh, directories in a learning pipeline, how to um, archive things in a more systematic way. But the problem again is that then they're like, right now 20 different approaches to do best practices. And I think it will still need a couple of years to kind of consolidate around fewer things, fewer tools, fewer practices. Um, I'm not sure. I think you see this a lot these days. People use just cloud service for model serving, kind of for inference service to, up, to push this to the cloud and let somebody else do the load balancing stuff. Um, especially if they want to scale this, which maybe a couple of years ago, like in the technical debt paper that I signed a while ago, uh, was the, a lot of code was just around this kind of part, which has been kind of abstracted away. All right. I think this is, this is what I have. Um, right, so what we talked about is really think about the design top down, right? Think about the entire system. Again, you need a system perspective. Think about what are the qualities of interest. Think about what does it take to do this? What are the main building blocks? Think through the system just in terms of bandwidth or just in terms of performance, just in terms of scalability. And then think about trade-offs. Think about different decisions, how you can justify them, how you can identify what the important component are, how this restricts your design. And I think that's all I had today, right? So software architecture is a field that's established and I think it's very important here. I'm not sure how much we need to customize it or how much we just need experienced software architects, um, but there are certain lots of problems. Um, and I think the obvious parts that I talked about were deployment architecture, telemetry, and maybe when and how to update um, and how to serve this. That's all I have. Um, as usual, sticking around for questions. <laughs>